You're about to be recorded. Recording in progress. Uh, good morning, all. Welcome to the next uh, iteration of the AGI discussion forum. And uh, what we're going to hear about today is some work by the uh, Siberian mad mind himself, uh, Anton Anton Kalonin, which relates in general to experience-based learning in AI systems. So how does an AI system take a stream of data or events or coming into its sensors, which could be from outside the system or, or inside the system in general? And how does it how does it make sense of this stream stream of events? And I mean, there's a lot of point, a lot of aspects to this question. Starting with a simple one of how does it even segment up the stream of events into into pieces, so it knows what pieces to focus on in terms of parsing out more more detailed structures. And this is a general AGI-ish question. It's also a question that that comes up in say robotics where a system needs to partition the stream of data coming into it into into discrete events it comes up in in financial markets where you want to identify an, an event like a you know a bull, bull run or, or 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 a bear run or just a market regime or a sub regime and it comes up in natural language processing in speech, where you want to find the beginning and end of a word, in audio, in text, where you want to find the beginning and end of a of a, of a word or a, or or a sentence. So, Anton's going to talk about some recent empirical results regarding some fairly simple math and algorithms for segmenting streams of data, and I'll also uh, share some thoughts about how this fits into the overall. AGI quest. So with, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Kalonin. Okay, thank you, Ben, for introduction. So let me share the screen and let me uh, show my slides. And <clears throat> uh, let me just give extension of Ben's introduction. So the experiential learning term uh, is kind of interesting term, which was around small AI community of WebMind almost 25 years ago. So I don't remember who coined this term. Maybe, maybe it was Ben, maybe it was Jeff Pressing or Stefan Bugai, uh, but we actually use that experiential learning uh, term for the context which is now uh, call, <clears throat> uh, framed by reinforcement learning in machine learning and data science community. Uh, but uh, in my view, I, I think it's wise to have some kind of new birth to this term because uh, the experiential learning is a wider uh, concept compared to reinforcement learning because in experiential learning, you don't need feedback. You don't need reinforcement. In experiential learning, you just need experience. And it might be the feedback or reinforcement as a positive reinforcement or positive feedback or negative feedback. It might be explicit feedback, like someone kicks you or someone, someone gives you a sweet if you are doing something good and kicks you if you are doing something bad. Or it might be uh, implicit reinforcement or, or feedback. So you may somehow encourage yourself for doing something right like you might be predicting something pretty well and you can reinforce yourself based on that predictions and also this reinforcement that you are doing for yourself based on your good predictions or bad predictions good actions or bad actions might be also either implicit because you are consciously providing some feedback or reinforcement to yourself, or it might be con con subconscious because, because some reinforcement or feedbacks might be coming under some unconscious uh, uh, schemes uh, <clears throat> that you don't realize. <clears throat> so the motivation of this work uh, comes from two pieces. And by the way, the story of, of this talk is that I actually have got some 
um, interesting, at least to myself, results on uh, my pet uh, unsupervised learning project, which I started to run uh, some time ago, trying to extend the work that we have done um, with uh, Linus, uh, Andreas, uh, Alexei, and some other people at uh, singularity net uh, a few years ago <clears throat> i just started to try to move, move forward with this and i have got some interesting results which will be shown at the end of this talk <clears throat> and i suggested to ben to provide give presentation of these results but then ben suggested to make the presentation kind of more agi ish so i decided to start with actual framework of the experiential learning as I have presented it uh, a couple of years ago on the AGI conference, but today I will dig um, uh, uh, deeper into uh, this topic. Uh, after that, I move on to the work that we are currently doing at Singularity DAO. Uh, and finally, I will end up with experiments, uh, experimental results that I have got on that <coughs> unsupervised language learning. <coughs> So, uh, uh, fundamental motivations are the two. So, first of all, as Ben mentioned, uh, identifying successful or unsuccessful sequential experiences during the experiential learning is important for successful reinforcement learning or self-reinforcement learning, as it is called uh, by different people in machine learning community. And by the way, when I actually was wrapping up the paper for Archive on this subject, I have found very recent work um, by Schmidt Huber and his team. Uh, it's uh, referenced at the left bottom corner of this slide. And actually in the uh, abstract of their paper, they are uh, saying almost exactly what is said on this slide. So. You just need to be able to slice up uh, temporal experiences into some abstract sequences uh, and then operating at higher level of such sequences. By the way, uh, these sequences are corresponding to somewhat what Marvin Minsky called narrative stories. So if you are able to figure out some narrative stories out of your experiential activity, then you can uh, get on, on the higher level of this um, on top of these abstractions and uh, operate with, with these abstractions as a symbols uh, at higher level of cognitive uh, activity. So that's uh, and uh, um, the one of uh, one of the motivations of this work was to be able to figure out how to actually uh, slice these temporal experiences or sequential experiences. <clears throat> because if you are having some experiences recorded in the database, like sequence of spoken sounds or sequence of typed letters, that's not temporal uh, experience, that's just sequential data which corresponds to some temporal uh, developments uh, uh, being recorded into the database or to audio file or video file or whatever. <clears throat> And another uh, motivation for this work is try to uh, solve a couple of problems that we are, we are not able to solve during the past work on that unsupervised language learning project. By the way, we just have had email exchange with Linus this morning. Uh, Linus was saying that he is also trying to come up with some um, uh, framework for doing actually tokenization because uh, when we were working on unsupervised language learning a couple of years ago, uh, we were all this tokenization was done by handcrafted tokenizer, which had taken, I believe, almost three months of uh, Andres Suarez work and was quite annoying because uh, once we were to tokenizing um, uh, Gutenberg children corpus to <coughs> words and we were, we were starting to actually learn grammars from these words each time uh, we were finding some bugs, uh, issues with tokenization and we had to go back and fix these tokenization rules. It was quite annoying. So <coughs> one of the motivations was that, that okay, so we need to start up uh, <coughs> with that unsupervised language learning work, but let's start from the bottom ground because if you are trying to do language learning or on based on some hand-coded tokenization rules, that's quite kind of not fair. So let's do it fair. Let's start just from ground zero 
we just have a sequence of something we don't know where are the words what are the words what are the punctuations so let's just uh, figure out how to slice them and when we slice them that let's try to build grammars on top of that <clears throat> so that was the second motivation so let's start uh, from the first motivation from experiential uh, learning which uh, <clears throat> i was describing in the present in couple of years on uh, the work uh, uh, on the AGI conference. So the idea is that uh, uh, I decided to come up with some uh, simple, uh, uh, simplified, in some sense, version of the OpenAI Gym uh, framework. Uh, the uh, goal of simplification was to be able to uh, have control over the uh, feedback or reinforcement that is coming out of the system because when uh, you uh, are gi given uh, open AI gym environments you don't have uh, control over the way the reinforcement is given so you can't actually uh, run different experiments depending on different um, uh, delays of the reinforcement and in this environment we were able to have different kind of uh, delayed reinforcement in one in simple, simple cases in in, sim, in simple in one experiments we were providing fe uh, positive feedback when the ball was reflected by the rocket okay so the, and that was a, a, in this ways we were able to get learning faster in the other cases we were get, getting we were, we were providing feedback only when the ball is hitting the ceiling and that uh, was um, and then the feedback was delayed and it was complicating the learning process and so, and so on so <clears throat> we were able to completely control this and that environment and the implementation was uh, operating on top of some abstract operational space which was described in terms of predicates so actually any sort of environment was um, capable to be described by any predicates some predicates were input like predicates for ball coordinates for predicates for racket coordinates predicates for uh, sadness and happiness which could be interpreted as a positive or negative feedback then other pre predicates like moving the racket were output predicates and then um, just given the sp operational space express it in terms of input and output predicates there is an agent that should be able to uh, on one hand infer some predictive models and be able to predict the future based on the current states then based on pre predictions made on the current states it was able to make decisions on which actions to uh, uh, make towards the environments and further there was a compressor uh, compressor part of the model which was able to uh, compact the models in order to minimize the consumption of the resources and the experiment that uh, we were able to run in this setup uh, let me see if i can run it uh, let's see for some reason okay so let me run this experiment Okay, so uh, the setup was that we are kind of playing the ball, the ping pong, against the wall. And right now we are seeing the process of learning uh, the rules and um, being able to how to be how to win in this game in real time. And uh, the way we learn it <coughs> uh, is that uh, whenever we have the sequence of states where part of the state is uh, environment uh, variables and another part of the states are the actions that we uh, uh, execute against this environment so actions and state are all parts of the environment and there is a sequence of state that, that we percept at the moment and whenever there is a positive feedback which is green so when we are when the screen is flashing green then we are getting positive feedback and in this setup it happens with delay it happens when the ball is hitting the ceiling and not when the ball is uh, being reflected by the rocket so whenever we are getting feedback we uh, reinforce or we uh, somehow uh, provide positive uh, feedback for entire sequence of states so there is no propagation uh, like it's happening in Q learning or deep Q learning it's kind of uh, one shot learning so if you watch the process of this uh, game you will find that whenever a right move in particular state is uh, happening then agent 
never makes mistake in this state. So whenever, so it learns, it's it's one one shot learning. The only problem that is that uh, to some states and it can it can get from the other states. So for example, uh, you see that it was able to catch the ball in the uh, right side of the uh, battlefield, but then it needs to learn how to move the racket to the left side of the battlefield. Battlefield, and when you it, it is able to learn how to move quickly the racket to the left, then it is not able to return it quickly to the right. And it needs to find some to take some more training in order to memorize the situ different situations how he can uh, how it can return the racket to the right. So now, <coughs> and once uh, he is uh, capable to learn, he is never having mistake. He is always uh, playing without of error. So uh, so here on the screen you can see the bars. So uh, uh, on different sizes of the battle uh, game field you can see the red peaks and the blue peaks. So the red peaks are misses and the blue peaks are uh, wins. Uh, so whenever it is able to win all the time, it wins all the time without of no any enemy pro uh, <coughs> misses. But uh, the framework that we had here, uh, 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 which made it possible to learn quickly in real time, uh, much so faster than you can do it in OpenAI Gym, because there you need uh, lots of uh, training uh, epochs. So uh, the uh, simplification that we had is that we were able to frame the sequence, uh, the uh, sequences of states uh, into uh, compact sequences so that you can actually consider that it was some small episode. So some uh, like, for example, any feedback, either positive or negative in this mm, uh, experimental setup was stopping the previous experience and starting the new experience and that's not the case in open ai gym because in open ai gym you get the positive feedback when you uh, catch the ball reflect the ball uh, i mean the pawn game or um, uh, uh, any games like that but if you miss to catch the ball you never get feedback so it's like uh you can you wake up in the morning then you go to to the office and the, in the evening you start playing ping pong with the uh, friends and then you uh, make a good shot you reflect the ball when playing with uh, friends but then the whole history of your day is being reinforcement and you need to propagate and you don't know where was the beginning of your uh, right move uh, of sequence of uh, right uh, movements that caused the uh, successful reflection on the ball. Uh, so that's the w why it takes so long mm, uh, to learn OpenAI Gym and we have applied uh, this approach uh, straightforwardly for OpenAI Gym it, and it was consuming too much resources to play to, to learn the game in reasonable amounts of time. So the idea that we have learned the problem, the uh, concept that we have learned during this experience is that we need somehow figure out where is the beginning of the sequence and where is the end of the sequence so we can actually deal with the sequences and uh, provide the reinforcement for shorter sequences which are kind of, kind of uh, self-contained and worth uh, individual consideration <coughs> another interesting uh, uh, part of experiment that we have run is that we have run the same experiment with the same size of the battlefield and the same numbers of epochs and the same uh, other hyperparameters in two different operational en environments. First operational environment was that we just take the pixels and we render the whole picture as, with the pixels. So the ball is rendered by one pixel and the racket is surrendered by another pixel and we just have no idea which pixel correspond to what. We just, we just have predicates for uh, pixels, either pixels are black or white at particular points of the screen and we have the pretty and the, the, these are just um, uh, uh, predicates with two arguments then there, there are of course um, predicates for happiness or sadness for uh, feedback and there are predicates for moving left to right or staying in place as uh, <coughs> expected and then we were able to learn in this environment but another environment was symbolic and then this symbolic environment we were we were having different sets of predicates like coordinates of the ball coordinates and coordinates of the rocket and the uh, racket 
and everything else was the same. And what is interesting is that we were able to uh, learn how to play the, this game in the same, nearly in the same number of epochs, regarding of the experimental setup. Same number of epoch, epochs, same success rates under the uh, given com configuration of the hyperparameters for uh, same si size of the battlefield and sa same setup for the reinforcement, positive or negative. The only difference was amount of computing resources. So, of course, when we were dealing with the pixels, it was taking a substantially larger amount of the computational resources. And so another reason of why we would need to uh, segment the operational environments uh, from fine-grained lower level predicates to higher level more abstract and more structured predicates is just in order to account for uh, the clause of the AGI definition about the uh, resource consumption, right? So we need not only to operate in general um, generally complex environments uh, reaching complex goals, but we also need to be able to operate within the constrained amount of resources and we need to uh, minimize the consumption of the resources. <coughs> and that's another reason why we, we need to consider the structuring of the stimuli and the perceptual schemas and the, the episodes um, that we experience not only on ter in terms of time but also in terms of space and uh, some, uh, I would say, uh, theoretical background uh, that uh, how we can approach that is, uh, on one hand, we can come up with some unified uh, ontology schema, which could describe uh, any uh, things like the, uh, any uh, perceptual or experiential uh, situations and any operational ontologies. So this schema, uh, ontological schema, has two layers. On the bottom layer, you have uh, some events. These are atomic events. And these, some of the events may, might be assembled into coincidences. And both event has, uh, is, has, is attributed by time. And any coincidence of events is also attributed by time. And then any coincidence of events uh, can be associated with a process. So the process is just sequence of states aggregating multiple uh, atomic events and in turn every event has lots of attributes, att attributes which can be uh, considered as actors <coughs> or properties of this event and that's what we are uh, having at the input of the uh, perceptions. And then we can aggregate them based on multiple experiences of the so if we are, we are able to chunk these uh, repeating uh, processes of coincidences uh, uh, unifying some events we can just create higher level abstractions where we have appearing generic abstract appearances um, on top of the events then we have situations uh, of uh, um, aggregating multiple appearances uh, on uh, <coughs> the uh, aggregate uh, on top of the coincidences and we have some generic scenarios on top of the processes and uh, whenever we have some generic appearances we have some generic roles being played by individual actors and that's what we have on more abstract level so that's kind of the uh, uh, higher level ontology and uh, using this ontology you can describe uh, any uh, situations like here we have tried to describe some uh, uh, higher level abstract scenarios and lower level uh, uh, instances or processes describing some uh, anti-corruptional anti-corruption study like uh, at the beginning you have uh, some generic situation when there is some person who is head in some state department and the, his, this person has wife and the department is uh, state organization and then there is another situation when the person can uh, have he, his wife to found some commercial company or there is another situation when there is an inspection coming to the state department sorting out that if there is a person who is having a wife who has some uh, public company uh, commercial company and depend, based on that uh, whether we are going on this direction on on this direction there might be different situations like in in one case the uh, husband may spend some money government money to that uh, commercial company some being subcontracted uh, by the state department 
otherwise if there is uh, another direction of the the process development then the, the um, government money would be spent on purpose to uh, subsidize and uh, sick children and that's on abstraction level but this abstraction level can be derived by derived by multiple um, instances of the uh, Evans uh, actors uh, s situations and uh, processes uh, with uh, real pe per persons, real companies and the real re real uh, children and real um, audit uh, persons performing the audit of the company. <coughs> and when we have this framework, like uh, higher level uh, roles and appearances in situations and scenarios, and that instance level actor seven instances processes, you can figure out a bunch of cognitive processes that uh, can on one hand derive abstractions from the instances, and then they, they can figure out the actors from the events and so forth and so forth. So we won't go into the details of this. I will jump further saying that uh, you ca if you can take this framework as a ground, you can uh, state that everything can be considered as a process of a scenario. So analysis of the sequence of spoken language, the spoken uh, uh, sp sounds of spoken language can be considered in this framework while doing the um, speech recognition. Also, you can handle the written uh, language uh, character or optical character recognition fit, fit into this framework. You can uh, have a text pattern matching being identified and uh, classified and processed within the same framework. And finally, you can do some uh, analysis of uh, events in the uh, social in the community uh, and doing social analysis of these of uh, things uh, developments like that in the same uh, framework. Uh, and uh, then uh, that's application of this concept actually suggested independently uh, by uh, my uh, Novosibirsk colleague Evgeny Vityaev uh, in his discovery system. And here is example uh, because I will uh, write on the next slide. I move to the one, move on to the work that we are doing at Singularity DAO. <coughs> this is example of how uh, they were developing somewhat similar approach uh, for financial prediction, financial market predictions. So they were able to use that discovery system based on what they call. Um, uh, um, uh, uncertain uh, or probabilistic uh, sem semantic logic uh, in order to detect some stable invariant uh, sequences of events on the financial markets. Like for example, uh, being able to observe multiple variations of price on particular market, they were able to identify four different structural patterns like price going up for certain number of days, they, then price goes down for, down for certain numbers of days, and then it goes, uh, it goes up again for the certain numbers of days, and starting and the beginning of these sequences are corresponding to particular days of week. And uh, this framework uh, pretty uh, nice, if uh, very well fits the concept of that uh, scen scenarios that can be found based on the observation of the processes or uh, uh, instances of symbolic uh, sequences detected on the uh, in the exper experiences, but uh, memorize it as some abstract invariants of the sequences so they can be uh, learned, in, learned in real life, uh, applied in real life. Uh, the problem again that we have here is that we need to be able to identify what are the beginnings and what are the ends. So in order to uh, count for uh, figure uh, find the statistical evidence of some repeating occurrences of some uh, coincidences or uh, of events or individual events, you need to be able to say, okay, so here I have something starting on Friday and ending on Monday. Here again, I have something starting on Friday and ending on, mon on Monday. And then having this observed multiple times, I can conclude that, okay, so here is the repeating structure that I need to uh, uh, that I that I need to memorize, but how can I figure out that that's the beginning that I of something that I need to memorize, and here is the end of the something that I need to memorize? Uh, we'll get back to this answer a little bit later. Now I'll just move to some possible applications of this um, concept uh, that we can apply in our crypto finance work. 
So let's consider the same cognitive model of an agent which has the predi uh, predictor which can predict the future, decider which can select the optimal scenarios across multiple predicted uh, trajectories of development and then we have a compressor which compresses the models so it keeps within the available amounts of resources and it has some perceptions. And the perceptions now correspond to different operational space. So right now we have the predicates not for ball uh, and for racket, but we have predicates for the perception of price and the perception of the orders, actually the actions of the orders that we make on the market. And then the base values uh, are like uh, getting high returns and getting low losses. If we can't get high returns, the inferred models are like causal relationship between the price high and need to create the ask orders. Observed evidence might, might be that there is some high price at the point uh, in time T1 and the, the actions might be like create the ask order at the time T2. And then based on uh, predictions and decisions, we just percept particular events on the market and we make the actions. So that just um, um, describing the uh, conventional uh, reinforcement learning task in terms of this particular approach. But now let's move this uh, model in the framework of the uh, crypto finance or generally speaking finance ecosystem that we have to deal with at Singularity DAO. <coughs> So in the middle we have the agent and uh, at the input we have some per market, market data like OHLCVs, trades and the levels uh, of the limit order book and we have some media news. Unfortunately, uh, being able uh, to process the raw trades uh, would, would, would cause uh, too much spending on the resources because you will just waste uh, lots of time and money on processing uh, all raw trades whenever you need to make uh, tra sell or buy decisions. So normally we are pre-processing this data. So we are aggregating this data in different forms. We are creating also all sorts of indicators. Uh, we can compute different, uh, we can compute the price differences, trends, it can evaluate trends, uh, evaluate imbalances between the sell and buy uh, volumes of trades and uh, imbalances on the ask and bid um, side of the order book. We can also infer some sentiment um, on the social media news and dis cognitive distortions as well. And then this aggregated and, com and compacted data finally may be fed to the agent in order to make uh, decisions while operating on the market. Further, when the, uh, an agent uh, has to operate on the market, it can again uh, do it in a few ways. First of all, of course, it can uh, create ask and bid orders or, or it can create just market orders uh, to make the buys and sells. Uh, unfortunately, any uh, works that I have seen on this kind of straightforward application of the reinforcement learning uh, didn't work well. So I didn't see any uh, work that would render uh, actually any reasonable results on this straightforward reinforcement learning approach. So the approach that we were exploring at Autonio and uh, I expect that we would try to run it, explore it a little bit further at Singularity DAO is that instead of doing direct operations on the market, we are just um, driving the hyperparameters of the trading bot, where the hyperparameters of the trading bot, mark, or uh, in particular market making bot, are just uh, 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 representing what can be called the strategy. So for example, if we set particular spread for this bot, and if we specify particular refresh rate of the bot, like for example, create the bid ask spread for two points always, or five points always, and uh, cancel the order whenever uh, price uh, changes more than uh, three points, or whenever the price changes five points, and refresh your orders, or make sure that you need or don't need to refresh your orders every uh, five minutes or every 30 minutes. So all these are kind of uh, bot parameters and the uh, 
combination of the parameters indicate the bot strategy and then what the purpose in this context the purpose of the agent is not uh, force uh, or an agent to actually cancel or create particular orders but rather to change the parameters according to specific market conditions where the market conditions uh, are obtained from these aggregated metrics uh, here is example of um, what can be done at what we are doing right now so for example what we were doing in Autonio uh, is uh, we had pretty simple a market making agent which was driving just a couple of parameters like spread uh, and uh, cancellation for order cancellation policy and it was basing its uh, operation based on single single aggregated parameter is price difference so input just single pr price difference and output is the uh, spread uh, and the order cancellation and I will see results uh, of how this agent performs a minute later, uh, but uh, uh, we actually can get much more. So for example, here you can see distribution of some important um, metrics that we can derive from the market data. And most of these metrics are uh, corresponding to particular imbalances like bid ask imbalances or uh, 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 price imbalance whether the average price on the bid ask side uh, bid side is further away from the midpoint than, than the price on the uh, ask side, bid side or the other way around you can find that if you normalize this uh, some of these parameters these parameters don't have middle point so either it is here or it is here so either black or white here either black or white uh, here either black or white so and uh, presence of such parameters that uh, are either black or white on the real market data gives some hope that we can somehow symbolize the uh, market uh, conditions into some letters where the letters or the words where each word uh, is built from the letters and each letter corresponds to either black or white on either of these parameters like a we can have either a1 or a2 b we can have either b1 or b2 so if we can cre uh, describe the market the flat market conditions like a2 b1 uh, c2 d d2 and that's the flat market and that's another flat market and it also this it is also described by the same uh, numbers of parameters and the interval when the market is crashing is described by another word uh, co consisting of another simple symbol and slightly growing market uh, slightly um, going up market can be described by another a number set of letters <laughs> or words then we can actually represent the uh, market hit uh, market history as a sequence of letters and then we can segment the market into the chunks of the experiences and we might find some repeating letters and if we are able to find some repeating letters we can actually create some grammar or language of the market and if we learn the language or grammar of, of the market we would be able to actually uh, predict them at least predict the market and uh, make decisions based on the prediction like if we know uh if we are if, if the market is saying i like then we can anticipate that the next word will be pizza or beer and act accordingly and in other scenario as ben uh, wants we might also be able to find some ways to manipulate the market like for example if we uh, say but uh, if uh, some of the actions that we derive toward, towards the market may be uh, considered as parts of these words then we might contribute to uh, these letters and changing some uh, letters in some words uh, while the market is developing we might be actually uh, uh, causing uh, some uh, uh, next word to be the word that we anticipate uh, moving to practical results so here is the framework that we partially have for that uh, so-called adaptive multi-strategy agent so the environment where it works uh, contains real exchange and this real exchange is the uh, exchange where the real agent is trading so we have a few number of single strategy agents which are trading on the real market making 
uh, that we are doing real market making on the real exchange. At the same time, we are having the market data and market data is being aggregated into the simulation and backtesting framework. And at the same time, we have multiple single strategy agent, agents, much more single strategy uh, virtual agents, which operate, uh, which do, which, which do backtesting on that virtual uh, environment created based on that uh, uh, data streamed from the real market. Notice that uh, we have, might have hundreds of the agents operating in virtual space and few agents operating in, in real space because uh, the controller of this environment uh, uh, monitors the agents uh, trading in virtual environment and selecting those agents who are getting the greater profits and, and losses given the current market environment or current market conditions. And then these strategies of these winning agents are injected into the agents who are doing real time market making uh, on the real exchange and we have the profits and losses collected and we can somehow validate whether the choice was right or not. And here is the example of how it can work. So here you, we see some market history where the market is uh, declining. And so you can see that the hodler and uh, the hodler is getting uh, losses. So red bars corresponding to losses and uh, uh, red bars corresponding to losses and green bars corresponding to profits. So you can see if you get uh, the hodler agent, of course, he is losing because the market is going down. And if you get some multiple agent strategies, but all of these strategies, all the bars except Hodler are just corresponding to different combinations of the spread and the order cancellation policy. You can see that more than half of the agents are getting uh, losses and less than half agents are getting um, uh, positive returns, profits. And if you apply this framework to the same interval of the time, uh, so you are able to select the agents on each of the time intervals on the market, then you will find that your adaptive agent is getting uh, profits uh, two times more than two times larger than uh, the, uh, the, the losses of the single hodler. And that's the same experiment that we have run with uh, different under different market conditions uh, for, uh, sorry, not for, this, for the same market conditions, but uh, for different families of strategies, like using some simple strategies uh, that we have implemented ourselves, the strategies that were used by Autonio Neox Maker, the strategies that are being um, executed by the Hummingbot, uh, Hummingbot agent uh, that we were going to use in production in Autonio, and uh, we run it on hourly intervals, on minutely intervals, and uh, using different strategies. And what we can see that in uh, most of the cases, that adaptive agent is uh, getting, so adaptive, agent, adaptive agents are here. So for example, so third bar in the row. So uh, if we take this, the base, basic agents, then on uh, three days strategy update interval, uh, when everyone is losing, including the hodler, then the adaptive agent is winning on hourly updates or uh, winning a very little on the uh, minutely updates. If you're using New York's agent, then the wins are much greater. And uh, so return of investment is uh, 3% for six days. And if you have Hummingbot, then uh, returns are 1% uh, for six days. Uh, but th these results are not very reliable because it's just six days. We have run these experiments on much larger time scale, like three different months of three different market conditions. And based on these experiments, we have found that the humming bot is superior over these three guys. And that's the reason why we will be trying to adapt this uh, experiment that we have run in the backtesting in the backtesting framework to try to uh, port this to real uh, time trading based on the humming bot uh, environment on the Binance. <coughs> now, moving on to the third part of the discussion, uh, uh, you can apply uh, this concept of uh, sequential experiences to any task, like for example, the uh, well-known problem of the process mining in business log data in order to identify uh, good 
uh, beneficial or non-beneficial uh, sequences of states and state transitions in some business automation or some just business processes uh, you can use uh, and you can actually also uh, symbolize these processes and you can figure out the good words that uh, bring money to your business uh, uh, good words that bring money to your business or some bad words that actually make your business to lose money you can actually apply this in order to figure out some uh, uh, self-contained sequences of events that are happening on user interface by user who are uh, going through the website so if you monitor the click-throughs of the users uh, who, uh, going through your website you can somehow find what people are doing there based on the click-through experiences figure out the specific sequence of states like for example finding the roads typical roads for uh, finding the particular particular sorts of cars or particular sites of products and finally moving closer to uh, the actual results that we have got in this area is uh, ability to learn grammars so that's the slide from the Linus Webster's presentation that he has made on last year, Interpretable Language Processing Workshop. On the fields of the AGI 2021 conference, so he, on one hand it renders uh, what can be uh, um, uh, thought as a grammar of the uh, human language sentence. So that's the lean grammar connecting the words but also besides connecting the sequences of words into the uh, sequences representing particular uh, meanings you can also associate these uh, words uh, also by some higher level in grammar with particular uh, happenings that are happening in his physical sp space so here you can see that one in grammar is connecting particular events or physical movements of particular person or a robot like raising elbow and turning the twist another part piece of lean grammar is connecting the words representing the uh, saying like it hurts when when i do this and then there is a another link uh, of some higher level lean grammar which corresponds to some anaphora connector between the uh, textual representation of the world and physical state of the world and then uh, the, uh, moving forward through the experience of the uh, patient uh, uh, to doctor interaction then another event of this experience is a doctor saying that you don't don't need to do that which can be also broken down in the, into the links so you can have the links in the at the language level you can have links at the uh, physical events level you can connect them by uh, another sort of links and you can build it into the sequence by the other sorts of links uh, going uh, deeper into the language modeling or describing the um, linguistic structures, here is the way uh, uh, I uh, was actually I am developing this approach uh, starting 2015, nearly the same way, uh, nearly the same time then Linus uh, started these experiments on Lean Grammar uh, learning. <coughs> so actually, uh, it corresponds pretty well to the Linus's approach uh, if uh, add if consider Linus's sections so so far if we consider the approach that Linus follows and that we were following during the uh, supervised language learning process here we were considering only the links but besides the links you can consider something that Linus calls sections and in um, uh, the model that I'm developing the section is actually the sequence of uh, states or sequence of events in terms of the prior discussion or uh, you can think that higher level sequence of uh, mm, abstract entities like subject predicate and object is a uh, scenario abstract scenario and sequence of instances of these higher level abstractions like individual words that's the process so that's the instance and between the uh, abstract uh, is, is scenarios and um, uh, instances of these scenarios called processes you can uh, have the whole graph of the intermediate uh, uh, homonyms homonyms 
uh, or disjunctions, conjunctions, uh, fra frag fragments uh, like uh, noun phrase and verb phrase and uh, uh, subject phrase and all sorts of different uh, grammatical structures. So uh, whether you are learning the Lean Grammar or whether you are learning the uh, sequences, uh, sections or sequences representing same 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 size of the grammar, you have to address few issues. And here I am I'm getting to the issues that we are we're trying to solve during this work and end up with the results uh, that we have got in the end. <clears throat> so the first issue that I was stating at the very beginning is uh, absence uh, of explicit start-stop tags in continuous streams of space in the ex in experiential or, or self-reinforcement learning setups when the feedback is delayed or when feedback is sparse. So that's that's what was Ben was talking from the very beginning. And the particular problems that we have we have faced with um, this unsupervised language learning with Linus, uh, Alexei, and uh, the other gang is that first uh, we need uh, to figure out how to tokenize the text before we actually start the uh, word level grammar learning based on that. So we need to replace the hockey rule-based tokenization with truly unsupervised tokenization. And another problem that uh, we were trying to uh, solve here along the way is see if something uh, can be found uh, 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 some metric can be found for structuring the symbolic sequences instead of the mutual information because uh, the parses based on mutual information was not quite good. I don't want to go back to the uh, whole detail, gory details of our unsupervised le language learning experiments, but what we have found shortly is that if you create the good parses, somehow by hands or by lean grammar parser or i don't know they are just uh, magically coming from somewhere then you can uh, have this good right valid parses used to create reasonable grammars corresponding to the real uh, in language grammars but if you are trying to build these parses are uh, using the minimum uh, spanning tree parser based on the mutual information or found uh, just observing that sequence of symbols in the text. Or even if you are using what we call contextual information obtained, at, obtained uh, sucked out or milked out uh, of the BERT model. The results are even worse than you would just use sequence of words instead of the parse, what we called reference sequential parses. So uh, personally, I was quite unhappy with the quality of mutual information based uh, minimum spanning, spanning tree parser and so one of the hopes was that while uh, doing this search on the letter level we will find we, we could find something in some interesting ways of combining the uh, symbols into sequences and then maybe we can adopt this experience when operating uh, on uh, on the next level uh, at the word level and we have started with two works that we were able to find so these works were run by different guys and they were actually trying the same goal. And uh, in one work, uh, what have been tried is just uh, different uh, mix mixtures or, and combinations of the mutual information and conditional probabilities in the same way condition that conditional probabilities are used in conventional language modeling. And in one of the paper, uh, the guys were uh, playing with what they call can be transition freedom. And transition freedom is pretty simple concept, which simply says, uh, indicates number of uh, states that might take place after the current state. For example, if there is letter T, then you might have uh, point after letter T, you might have S after letter T, and you might have a space after letter T. So the number of uh, free, the uh, number of st states that might ha happen after the letter T is three. So transition freedom is three, pretty simple. But these transition freedoms might be counted not only in respect to word, uh, letters, they can be counted in respect to uh, letters, uh, combinations of words or n-grams. 
so actually in this particular example uh, this number of three states corresponds not to the single letter t but it corresponds to the sequence of p and t which is happening after the beginning of the sequence so when the sequence starts anything could happen so that's the maximum uh, so from the uh, from anything or from left wall as it called in lean grammar the uh, the uh, transition freedom or freedom of transition is maximum but whenever there is some starting sequence the uh, uh, beginning of the sequence the transition freedom gets smaller but whenever there is a delimiter like space then transition freedom is bumps because whenever you have a delimiter you have a lot of different things happening after the delimiter as well as before the delimiter and of course these uh, conditional probabilities uh, and transition freedoms may be counted in two directions so they may be counted left to right and they might be counted right to left uh, jumping ahead the results that we obtained with transitional freedom transition freedom were superior over everything else including mutual information and conditional uh, probability so mutual basis trying to uh, aggregate or tokenize uh, the words uh, based on the mutual information of symbols actually was uh, providing just disastrous results so we just uh, didn't use um, mutual information in a great search of the hyperparameters um, so what we tried was uh, conditional probability with different n of n grams for computing the conditional probability for n gram to n gram transition and we use a transition freedoms for n gram to n gram transitions and another thing that we have realized it is that that transition that that's good performance of the transition freedom somehow corresponds to the um, well-known concept of the uh, freestone uh, who is saying that the free energy principle is unified is kind of uh, ground for any uh, AGI uh, concepts and applications uh, while the uh, free energy according to Freestone is actually about not not so that much energy but it's more like about the uncertainty so uh, minimization of the uncertainty is the task that brain is trying to achieve and uh, actually tokenization uh, of the sequence of uh, letters uh, letters might be thought as a process of figuring out the boundaries where uh, the uncertainty is uh, high or low so within the word the uncertainty is low because when you are moved from letter to letter le letter you have lower uncertainty but whenever the word ends then there is a great boost of bump of uncertainty because you don't know what what happens next at the word level so some claims before we go to go to uh, nice some nice pictures <clears throat> uh, transition freedom has appeared to be superior over the mutual information and conditional probability then for English and Russian we have uh, found that there is one specific way uh, of using this transition freedom and um, a specific set of hyperparameters is providing the decent results at the f1 from 0.96 to 1.0 for Chinese it was a little bit different so for Chinese we needed uh, another one uh, metric derived from the transition freedom and another set of hyperparameters <clears throat> so for the, the state of the art for English and Russian was up to 1.0 uh, F, F, F score for Chinese it was a little bit worse uh, because of some discussion that uh, might take some extra time uh, further uh, as we have found in the language learning project uh, on the word level that I mentioned before we have found that larger larger corpora is not necessary so for English the best results were obtained with the very smallest corpus I will just show the corpora a bit further but the smallest corpor corpus was providing the most uh, ac accurate results <coughs> I, I, no, th that was not because it was small it I guess it was just because it was just having the least noise so if you have a, a corpus which is rich enough to cover the language model then you don't need to increase its size 
you just need to have it clean but if you have the large corpus which bes which doesn't uh, just cover the language in multiple uh, in in redundant way but also introduces some errors then you get worse quality <clears throat> so that was also confirmed by the fact that if we try to somehow compact the model uh, pruning the low uh, st statistically uh, uh, expressed links between the uh, words and, and grams transitioning one to another, we were uh, improving the uh, model, uh, the, the tokenization quality. Uh, we, can, we have also found that if uh, we consider this approach to be some practical, if we would like to have this uh, transition freedom based tokenization applied for some practical tasks, like tokenization of the language uh, streams of the uh, character letters for natural language processing. It appears even better sometimes than lexicon based because if you try to do tokenization based on lexicon, you might never be sure that your lexicon that you have uh, downloaded from somewhere or, or just uh, assembled from some other sources, you might be never sure that this lexicon is complete enough to deal with the text that you have to deal with in, in your real uh, task. But, uh, and so that for Russian and for English, we were able to get higher quality with tokenization based on these transition freedoms than using some uh, 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 state-of-the-art lexicons that we were trying to use. Unfortunately for Chinese, it was uh, the opposite. I would have that was anticipated, but it might be longer discussion. Uh, and uh, now let me jump over to corpora that we have used. So for Chinese, we have used two different uh, subsets of the uh, new corpora of, 20, uh, of 270 megabytes and eight and a half gigabytes. For English, we have used Brown, Gutenberg Children, Gutenberg Adult, and uh, some social media corpus that we have acquired while doing sentiment analysis uh, for crypto market from Twitter and Reddit, and also so trying to do different combinations of this corpora. And for Russian, we also use it uh, one, uh, two different subsets of the RUSH test uh, uh, <coughs> of different sizes. And for testing, and so, so these were the corpora that we used to train our models. And in order to test these models, we use a parallel corpus of the same content for Chinese, English, and Russian. So Chinese and English corp cor parallel corpora corpus was downloaded and we have provided Russian translations for it. So all these models were tested the same and we were exploring which metrics are uh, practical for this tokenization. So we use a conditional probability. Uh, we use a deviation of this computer probability and we use a de derivative or difference of this conditional probability. And for transition freedom, we have also used um, uh, original pure value of this transition freedom, deviation of it, derivative of it, and we have tried different hyperparameters like can ends of n grams, like uh, unigrams, b grams, three grams, and combination of n grams of different rank. So we were computing the average for all of these metrics across different n grams. Then we were using different thresholds for model compression to remove uh, low st statistically low evident links and also threshold for segmentation like what is the uh, free metric value so we decide that okay it's high enough to um, cut the sequence here <clears throat> and for evaluation purposes we use some reference tokenizers like rule-based tokenizers for english and russian and uh, well-known jiba tokenizer uh, for chinese here are examples of how it worked. For example, here you see the profile of computing the uh, plane probabilities uh, of uh, 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 unigrams, like letters, uh, in forward direction and in backward, backward direction. So uh, green, bar, uh, sorry, orange bars correspond to direction from left to right, and blue bars correspond to direction from right to left. So you can see that if you take uh, the plane probabilities, you can nicely figure out uh, the tokenization based on the spaces. So you can nicely break the sequence into sp based on the spaces, but you can never detach quotes and uh, punctuation out of the words. So you can't figure out the, the isolate the punctuation. 
If you move on to using the <coughs> conditional probabilities, it's the same. So spaces are identified pretty well, but you can't identify the uh, punctuation, uh, commas, periods, and uh, all sorts of quotations and brackets. Also, you can find that some words may be cut into pieces, so that doesn't look right. And finally, if you go to the uh, transition freedom, uh, derivative of the, tra of the transition freedom in this, ca in this um, case, you can nicely cut the words by spaces and you can identify all quotation marks, all spaces, or sorry, all uh, commas and all periods. Uh, you can see that uh, let me just skip uh, jumping it qu quickly to the end so <coughs> here is the example of the grid search for hyperparameters so for example here is the hyperparameter search for english and the upper chart shows that the best the best results are uh, for appearing for uh, b grams uh, for threshold 0 0.6 and uh, 0 0.4 without of the compression of the model uh, on the brown corpus, but if we compress the model with a small threshold, we get the best results at 0 0.99 uh, with threshold uh, 0 0.4 for tokenization, and we can just use unigrams. So no bigram uh, needs to be no, bi no bigrams need to be involved. For Chinese, uh, situation is a little bit worse. So for Chinese, the best results are obtained with another metric. So with Chinese, we use so-called peak value. So the peak value is the metric invented by one of the authors of the work that we were doing, is the metric which corresponds to uh, the sum of the uh, uh, increase of the uh, value from the previous point to the current point minus the decline of the value from the current point to the next point. So that means if you have got increase before the current point and decrease uh, after the current point, then this increase and decrease are summed up and that gets you the number of what is called peak for every point. So for Chinese, these peak uh, metrics work the best. So for uh, with the model compression, uh, compress it and at, at uh, uh, so some threshold uh, for big grams and for any tokenization threshold uh, even without of any threshold, just if you get some number uh, of this metric above zero uh, under the value of 0 0.1, then you can uh, put the uh, word break here and you will be happy. <coughs> so here is example uh, of uh, typical mistakes that we are making for Chinese, which is interesting. So actually these mistakes are suggesting me that some uh, actually our uh, F score on Chinese is better than we evaluated formally because, for example, the, on the right, you can see obvious mistake because the period is uh, glued up to the uh, symbol. So, of course, that's a mistake. That's not right. But here you can see that these two words are collapsed uh, together by the tokenizer. Uh, however, uh, if you take these words uh, these uh, symbols apart and put them into the Google Translate and translate it into Chinese and you take these uh, translations into English and assemble them together, you will get the same meaning uh, as if you just put the same Chinese word into the Google, uh, Google Translate. So uh, I am not familiar with Chinese, but it suggests me that uh, the tokenization is not strictly strict in Chinese, so there might be different way of breaking symbols apart more canonical or less canonical and the final slide almost final so here are the uh, uh, here is the outline of the results that we have got so uh, if we get uh, freedom based tokenization for english then you get a score against reference tokenizer at 0 0.99 and also you if you try to check uh, what uh, is fraction of the words that you have found are actually part of the reference lexicon, you will find that the precision is the same. So almost every word that you have found is part of the proper English lexicon. Then if you take the Russian, also uh, you get 
F measure against um, uh, reference lexicon 1.0 and uh, sorry reference tokenization and every word that you have that you are able to find is part of the lexicon uh, reference lexicon and finally uh, that's interesting if you take Chinese then if you uh, figure out uh, evaluate the F measure of uh, tokenization against the reference tokenizer you get substantially low f measure f uh, 0 0.71 but if you check the uh, precision of the uh, lexicon the lexicon discovery you will find that uh, it is substantially good you will find that actually uh, it's 0 0.92 so most of the words that you were able to uh, uh, tokenize are still part of the uh, uh, proper lexicon even if the uh, tokenization appears not quite right and by the way if you uh, do this tokenization of the same text using the reference uh, tokenizer you will get almost the same number you will get 0 0.94 and very finally we were able to check that this uh, transition freedom uh, metric can be used to actually cluster the letters uh, in some uh, ontologies or hierarchies or, of uh, english symbols russian english nouns russian uh, sorry english uh, vowels and consonants uh, russian vowels and consonants right uh, bra brackets uh, and quotes uh, left brackets and quotes as uh, character uh, digits and so forth so that's the end i believe sorry for taking almost all allocated time spot yeah let's open things up for uh questions and uh, discussion then Like with respect to your process, uh, have you perhaps considered sort of a feedback approach? Well, like, uh, like uh, you try to understand the text, and first you kind of you kind of recognize, then you understand the text. Based on your understanding, you like to tokenize. This sort of approach uh, 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 is uh, also beautiful. I mean, uh, I considered this or, or uh, something like that. So, this is like a kind of suggestion. Yes, yes. Uh, so, that's pretty good. So actually, I had this on the slide. I just watched ra Russian uh, forward and skipped this mm, statement. So, let me answer. So, yes, indeed. Uh, mm, uh, of course, uh, what I have presented is not uh, an attempt to say that you don't need any feedback uh, for language learning. It doesn't say that you can just put some uh, newborn child into the locked room with a bunch of books and then after 16 years you just uh, let the child go out and uh, enter the university. <laughs> so I'm not claiming that. Uh, what I am claiming is that uh, unsupervised tokenization in respect to at least three languages appears uh, uh, good enough to be some starting point for further uh, reinforcement learning or self-supervised learning or whatever so yes so, so yes of course so so what i have uh, presented is just attempt to say that okay so yes so we can uh, do a lot without of supervision and without of reinforcement but of course in order, in order to uh, adjust the models and uh, validate the models against the reality you need to get feedback by the way another uh, important point is that uh, <coughs> this the uh, tokenization model that we uh, have used in this study uh, uh, for sure cannot handle certain things like contextual meaning of particular symbols like for example if you consider period in our model period will be always 
um, uh, indi indicated as a breaking point on both sides. Whenever period is happening after some symbol or another uh, symbol, period will be always alone, which is not true in terms of uh, in a, if you are talking about the floating point numbers or if you are talking about the decimal number or, or, or if you are talking about the uh, uh, web URLs. So we just didn't have this stuff in our uh, training set. So then uh, in some more uh, uh, what is called attention based or context based uh, uh, tokenization should be taken into account somehow. That's not part of the current study, but it is well understood that it should be in place. So, but the good thing still is that is the model that we have is what we call interpretable. So whenever you are getting some token being separated, you can <laughs> point to this token and figure out what's its transition freedom and what are the predecessor of this token and what are successors of this token on the current graph of transitions within your model and you make some judgment of why you are getting false positive or false negative in this particular case. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to say the time when these issues of there's two times in my own work when these sorts of issues have popped up as three, I guess, super significant and then they're all were all were tricky and not not none were fully solved. And so the, there's still a lot of need for work and experimentation here. So one was in finance where Matt and I were working with uh, Didier Sornet's models of financial crash prediction. And he, he, he found Sornet could predict a, a market crash pretty accurately by an exponential curve fitting the sort of bull run, then a cosine wave, then the oscillation at the top before the crash. And he had successfully predicted many market crashes that way. I mean, in, in, in advance. But what we found is he was using some human intuition to figure out where to start the initial exponential curve fit, right? And so that that's like, where where does that regime actually begin, right? And so if if you have Didier Sonnet's brain just to know the point where to start the exponential curve fit, then 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 everything else is automatic parameter tuning, right? So that's one thing. The, the other point where this came up that was really annoying is just speech segmentation, like chopping speech in, into words. And you know this Still, with Google Voice, when you talk to the Sophia or Grace robot or something, one of the guidelines you use for the robot to understand you well is to speak with clear gaps between your words, and then the robot has a better chance to understand you, right? And that's that's probably close to what, what Anton is talking about. Clearly, Google has not solved it too well because using Google Google Voice or any other current tool, I mean, empirically, it still gets you much better if you leave artificially large pauses between between your, your words and then it's getting those words, right? So again, it's boundary detection. And when dealing with either physical robots or even agents in a, in a game world, Detecting what's the boundary of an event was very important for semantic understanding. So, like, if 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 your robot in the game world is having a fight, then going on a quest, then digging for something. Like, what 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 when, when does the fight begin and end, and then when does the the journey to go somewhere be, 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 begin and end? And to to an extent, these are arbitrary boundaries. But if you're, if you're, I mean, concretely like creating nodes in atom space and then moving links to those nodes, like which, which event gets, gets a node created for it, right? And this, uh, this, 
this was hard and Shu Jing Ket and I way back when in Hong Kong were looking at various information theory methods for for setting these boundaries. And I, I mean I think in principle setting these boundaries for temporal events is not that different than setting boundaries for you know any other kind of internal stuff in a larger larger information field but the temporal version should be much simpler and, and it's still hard right like like where, where, where's the boundary around this cup versus the air around it is is, is a similar problem but where's the boundary around Ben Gersel versus the rest of the room is fuzzier because we got we got glasses, we've got hair, we've got we've got a shirt, and are those are those part of it or not? But we, if you're under the ocean or something, it's it's much harder. Like right? like where where's the boundary of a certain ocean current is a lot fuzzier, and that may bring you to the same kind of information theory that you have, that you have in in speech processing, and that's like a three D boundary of 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 an ocean current. So I, I think the same issues probably occur more abstractly if you're trying to identify a thought in your mind or say an emotional complex in your mind or a fear like where where is the boundary of the thought stuff of all of that thought or fear versus the other stuff going on in, 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 in your mind and in that case again it's going to be more like the ocean current or the speech case and less like the the cup case, right? Like we, we live in a physical domain of solid objects where boundary detection is often atypically simple. I mean, some like alien gas clouds uh, buzzing around in, in Jupiter may have these same difficult boundary detection problems for their own their own b bodies or something. So yeah, well, I think the problems Anton is looking at here while they're hard when you dig into them, are actually like the most simplified, sensible version of a more, more general problem of like where, how do you identify the boundaries of some coherent entity in some informational or 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 or, or, or pattern space? And you, it's not the sort of thing where there's necessarily a right answer always. I mean, in language tokenization, there's usually a right answer because you're assuming there's a certain collection of words that are that are are part of the language but if you're dealing with more emotive or interjective things like mm -hmm, then, then there may not be a single right answer either and there, there may be there may be many many right ways to 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 split it up so but that, that's uh that's more about why these are difficult and subtle problems and the you know the idea of using mutual information or something like that in some form there's an information discontinuity is 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 quite natural because things within and within a single coherent event boundary would seem to have more informational dependence than than, thing, than exists across event boundaries and that but then if you try to get really fancy and use like algorithmic information or something in, instead of statistical information and say, well, can something is in this grouping if, you know, it's much easier to compute based on other things in that grouping or mu much easier to use it to compute other things in that grouping than it is to do computation, to use it to compute things outside the grouping or to compute it based on things outside the grouping. You can try to go the way in a fundamental level, but then you can't afford to do like a program induction using some sort of a brute force or highly HDI-ish search every time you need to tell the boundary between two words or two events, right? So I mean, even if you try to formalize the right way to define these boundaries using some algorithmic information type things, that, <clears throat> that doesn't help because this is something that has to be done very fast in practice at a very low level in your in your AI system. So it's like about what's what's the best really crude, crude quick and dirty approximation to the more fundamental 
pattern theory or algorithmic information theory based definitions of, of informational grouping. And it's, it's interesting if that turns out not to be something shared information like, right, but something a little, a little different, like I don't want to say, because of course the the theorems that say shared information approximates algorithmic information are very, they're fine, but they're very dodgy with a lot of big constants bouncing around. So it's not really clear what's the best practical way to approximate fundamental computation in in real settings. And so that's, that's, that's why I think these results are interesting. We're getting some insight into what's, what's the best approximative way to make this particular sort of sort of pattern theoretic judgment quickly. Now the, the thing that's open in my mind is why, why is this sort of approximation work, work well? Like why does this work better than mutual shannon and in, 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 in information? And I, I haven't thought about much and don't fully understand it. So my, my comment has been a long way of leading up to that question in, in case Anton has any like philosophical insights into why these, these, these measures seem to work better than others. Right? Well, uh, so, so far, uh, the only uh, reference uh, inside, uh, full reference that I have is uh for instance uh, uncertainty so uh, i mean that instead of maximizing probability we need to minimize uncertainty so that's <laughs> the top <laughs> my, my top feeling at this at this point so actually uh, what i am looking forward i am uh, if i find some spare time and bandwidth uh, i would like to move on the next level and try to do uh, uh, parsing exercise uh, based on not uh, maximizing mutual information but minimizing uncertainty and see what happens there <laughs> and see if we can get uh, parses better than sequential yeah 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 i mean in terms of parsing andres suarez and i had a paper on putting a symbolic language we're learning together with transformer neural net modeling and we we uh did some prototyping on that last year and then uh sort of paused because i wanted to do it in open cog hyperon because the old open cog was too slow for various operations we needed and i, I didn't feel like building a building a totally totally separate system so now that now that hyperon is there uh perhaps this fall we will resume, resume that and get better than sequential parsing this way you know I, I know this we have very few people in this talk which is mostly i think because i stupidly forgot to advertise it on the open cognitive energy i email list which is because i'm I'm in the middle of moving house, so I just I've had little little time a little time at the computer. But I, I will I will I apologize for that. I just realized that at this moment. But I, I will I mean we 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 did, we did announce it on the list. I just didn't do my I I usually do a, a re re announcement of it on on on, on the list uh, the, the day before, which I, which I didn't do. And but we will take the recording of this and dis disseminate it on, on, on the list and, 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 and then uh, perhaps perhaps we can have some follow-up if, if folks have more to discuss on this we can do some follow-up discussions on this at, at the beginning of the, of the next stage